Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, who would like to welcome you to the fifth workshop, the workshop before the last workshop of today. I have the pleasure to moderate this session. My name is Amal Arab, and I'm moderating this session starting from the very important point, which is the importance of this forum. This is not just a forum where we have a gathering of researchers, a forum where they present their papers about the Palestinian cause and the challenges and contexts of the Palestinian cause. So we have a number of intellectuals, a number of media representatives, a number of journalists, and this makes the Palestinian cause a cause that is of a central importance. So the session today is going to talk about something that is very important, which is Palestine in Western and Arab media discourse. So we know the importance of this discourse. We who come from the different newsrooms, we know how it uh, looks uh, at the different behaviors of the different regimes in the Arab and Western worlds. And this is going to be the theme of today, where we're going to have a number of distinguished speakers. And uh, I'm going to introduce the different speakers today, but I would like to talk about something very important when it comes to the questions and answers that we're going to receive from you after the introductions that are being made. So sometimes, we are criticized uh, and people say that we do not give enough time to the different guests who want to intervene and take the floor. So that is why I would like you to write your questions and a number of coordinators we're going to, are going to pass through the different rows in order to collect those papers and that would be, give me the opportunity to pose the questions my, the, myself. So we have uh, Ben White, uh, who is the executive uh, uh, director of the uh, Palestinian Media Institute. Uh, so he has written and authored a number of books. So Palestinians in Israel, Segregation, Discrimination and Democracy. So she's translating the title of the book into Arabic. We have the 2014 Gaza War, 21 questions and answers. So now the question, the title is being translated into Arabic. So many books have been authors and hundreds of articles that have been published in The Guardian, The Independence, The Foreign Policy, Al Jazeera, and many others. So he is in the process of finishing his PhD at Exeter University. We have Dr. Khalid Lahroub, who is an Arab author, and uh, he is from uh, University of Northwestern, and uh, he used to be a researcher at uh, a number of institutes in the Arab affairs and international affairs in both Arabic and English. Some of them have been translated into different languages. And he did his MA at Kent University and also PhD from Cambridge University. And also he lectures in political Islam and many other topics. Also, he established the Cambridge Arab Media Project between 2003 and 2012. We would like also to welcome Dr. Yusuf Munir, non-resident researcher from Al Arabi in ACW. He is also member of the uh, editor's board and uh, he has uh, authored many articles uh, and published them in the New York Times, uh, Foreign Policy, and uh, many other 
periodicals, including Middle East policy, and he got his PhD in comparative international relations from Maryland University. And we have also the journalist and author Katie Halpern. He, she is a podcast presenter. And she has also a channel on YouTube where she talks about useful idiots, where she hosted Naum Chomsky, Noura Arikat, Rashida Talib, and many, many others. She studied philosophy, literature, history in the United States of America. Her thesis was about the Spanish Civil War, and she has published many, many articles in The Guardian, The New York Magazine, and so on and so forth. So our guest was fired due to the monologue she published defending Rashid Rashida Talib. Uh, Katie has published many films some of them embedded, uh, free to fly, and uh, the uh, travel uh, ban to Cuba, and also facey, facing racism uh, during the Spanish Civil War. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Ben White to present his paper. Go ahead, sir. begin by expressing my thanks to the organizers of the conference for your hard work and uh, dedication uh, and also to the, the friends uh, and the colleagues uh, who have gathered here over these days um, for a very rewarding uh, and enriching conference. Uh, I'm going to, I think overall this panel will, will touch on and cover different aspects of, of the, you know, the media issue in general, um, so it will be complementary in that way. And uh, for me personally, I'm going to speak a little bit about the British media and, and Palestine. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to do that uh, informed by my own experiences as a journalist, um, but also informed by my experiences uh, in the context of the Britain Palestine Media Center, which is uh, you know, a relatively new organization that I established uh, in 2020. And I'm just going to begin by summarizing my, my main points, really, uh, at the risk uh, of giving you the, the license to go and get some coffee for the next 10 minutes. Um, and that is, number one, uh, it's important to remember that the media is um, shaping public opinion, uh, but is also itself uh, impacted by and shaped by shifts in public opinion uh, and in certain demographics uh, too. In other words, the media is shaping but is also shaped by these types of uh, developments. Um, and the, the second point that I wanted to make, the main point really, is that while there remain long-standing challenges and problems in terms of how uh, the British media covers Palestine, there are also a lot of opportunities, opportunities which if identified uh, and used strategically can make a real difference both in the, the short term uh, and also uh, um, can contribute to this larger, longer term effort at, at public uh, narrative change. So I'm going to touch on two pairs of issues basically to kind of shape my remarks. Um, I'm going to talk about a few examples of what currently constitutes good coverage few examples of what currently constitutes bad coverage and then I'm going to share a few of what I think are the opportunities and the challenges um, in, you know, in the British media context uh, at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to start with the, the positives uh, and share a few of my reflections on what positive good coverage about Palestine looks like in the British media at the moment. What does it look like when it's good, when it's doing a good job? So one example that has um, 
sort of materialized more in recent years uh, is a, uh, an increased willingness to explicitly challenge or query the Israeli military's version of events in particular situations. Um, so in other words, rather than just say repeating claims that have been made by the Israeli army, for example, after killing a Palestinian in the West Bank, uh, it's more likely now, and this, and this does occur, that that claim about that version of events will be queried or it will be, you know, it will be suggested that there could be something amiss with that, with that version of events. Uh, another example that's linked uh, to that in terms of what good coverage can look like uh, is when there is relevant and useful context provided for whatever happens to be reported at the time. Uh, and that could be something as relatively straightforward as highlighting the fact that there is, for example, a military occupation in the West Bank, let's say. Um, but it also relates to, and this is similar to the first one, you'll sometimes see nowadays journalists, um, let, to give an example, let's say the Israeli military tells a journalist in response to a question about a Palestinian who's been uh, killed, we, were, we are investigating this incident or something like that. Right, a very standard response from the Israeli military authorities. Now it's a little bit more common, and this occurs in, in, in good reports, that the journalist will add something to the effect of highlighting the infinitesimally small number of examples where such investigations actually produce an indictment, let alone a conviction. So in other words, it's not just taken as assumed and there's a bit more information provided for the reader or the viewer, or whatever, to, to understand the context there. And I think the third, the third kind of way that there is good coverage in the British media and for me this part is critical, is when Palestinians themselves are centered in the, in the story itself. And that could be in the case of an interview, it could be in the case of uh, a Palestinian writing an op-ed or a comment piece, it could be that a journalist is examining a certain issue and actually quotes from Palestinian experts about a particular topic. And you know, when you see that happening, then for me that's a really key kind of aspect of what constitutes good coverage. So what does bad coverage look like? Um, the, you know, obviously all of these cases, there could be a lot of examples, um, but I'll just give a couple, again, from, from experience, and I'm sure these examples will be familiar to, to many of you as well. I think one way that bad, co bad coverage manifests itself is in the so-called both sides paradigm or both sides uh, framework, and it's you know, typically going along the lines of Israeli authorities say X and Palestinians say Y. Uh, and, it's, and it's presented in a way where you can't really, you're not really expected to uh, um, assume that either one is more true or false than, than the other. I think it actually often reflects a general approach to journalism and reporting that perhaps in other sort of walks of life and in other topics is maybe not as problematic. Um, but in the Palestinian case and in other, in other sort of related cases, it's insufficient uh, in and of itself for the, for the reader uh, to, to really understand what's happening. Uh, and you know, bad coverage also looks like something worse than the both sides paradigm, which is when the Israeli authorities' version of events effectively frames and shapes the entire uh, you know narrative of what's being reported, and that is still you know that's still quite common. That still takes place. Uh, and finally, the you know the, the, the sort of way in which media coverage of Palestine can be bad um, is you know the flip side of one of the ways in which it could be good, namely the absence of Palestinians from the coverage, the absence of Palestinian voices from what is being discussed um, uh, at hand. Uh, and in fact, it was that problem or that omission which incentivized me personally um, and kind of dominates the focus of the work done by the Britain Palestine Media Center. Um, and that's on the basis that the absence of Palestinians, uh, whether it's in the comment pages or in news reporting or analysis or in feature pages in you know, the arts and culture section, wherever, the absence of Palestinians in those spaces is not just like a moral or ethical problem, but it's also uh, a strategic problem too. Um, because I believe uh, that the, you know, when, 
when people in Britain hear directly from, from Palestinians, um, that's, that's the best way for them to understand the political reality that Palestinians are experiencing. Um, but also, that's what enables people to have an enriched and deepened understanding of Palestinian people and society and culture as a whole anyway. And, and all of that really is the best foundation for developing solidarity and political pressure. Um, and it's certainly better than when Palestinians are seen in a two-dimensional way uh, or in a sort of second-hand mediated way. Um, so just going to quickly mention um, a couple examples of challenges and opportunities, having touched on what media coverage can look like when it's good and bad. Um, challenges, and again, you know, some of these challenges actually are challenges in how the media covers a lot of different topics, to be honest. Not all of them are, are unique to Palestine. So one is just a lack of knowledge or awareness by the individuals producing the, the media, uh, you know, the media content itself. And again, that lack of awareness can just reflect the broader kind of social society lack of awareness about what's happening in Palestine. It could be shaped by cliche generalizations about two sides locked in an eternal religious struggle, blah, blah, blah. Um, another challenge, again, which is not unique to Palestine, is that there is just a lack of space and resources a lot of the time in the media. A lot of media outlets, especially nowadays, are stretched to cover what they want to cover, journalists are overworked, and foreign news or international news can often be the most squeezed part of a media outlet's uh, budget. Um, Palestine can also be seen by, by some producers and editors um, as a kind of quote-unquote tired story in a, in, a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a in a context where media has become a product there is uh, a drive to have fresh angles quote unquote fresh content and you know getting Palestine covered well can also suffer from that point of view uh, and then more specific to Palestine as well there can be a sense from the people making the making the media that the topic is controversial uh, and is likely to produce uh, I mean, I'm happy to do this all the time because for you not to think this is what I'm thinking, but for heated, heated responses from both sides, this can be uh, an impression that people have, um, which in the worst case scenario means that the topic won't be covered at all um, out of sort of someone feeling like they'd be getting out of their depth or wading into tricky waters or, or something like that. Um, or people will cover it, but with a high degree of caution and sort of conservatism in terms of how it's done. Um, and then finally, connected to that, but a little bit separate, is also the impact of you know, pressure and complaints that come from official Israeli government bodies to, to media outlets or from uh, you know, pro-Israel advocacy groups. Um, and that itself can produce a dynamic whereby journalists and editors almost preemptively uh, frame things in a certain way so as not to prompt this type of backlash. Uh, and so, finally, in this overview, I just wanted to touch on the opportunities as well. And these really do exist, and they've been around for a long time, but in some cases, these are accelerating as well. So, firstly, there is generally more sympathy, politically speaking, to the Palestinian people and the Palestinian people's situation. And again, like I was saying at the start, the fact that that exists in media outlets is partly a reflection of these broader changes in public opinion that have taken place. Um, connected to that is that there is more of an openness to actually hearing from Palestinians themselves. And in some media spaces in Britain, that can actually uh, create almost like a preference or desire to hear from Palestinians specifically as being viewed as the kind of oppressed group in the, in the dynamic. Um, so that's, that's also something that's been happening that happened especially in, in 2021, I think, as well. Um, the fact that Palestine is typically only covered in mainstream mass news uh, when there is an escalation on the ground or in a kind of crisis event, that's another challenge, but it can also be an opportunity when those, when those events occur as well, because then Palestine tends to be everywhere, uh, and if you've got things in place to take advantage you know, of those crises, uh, and make sure that the media coverage is impacted favorably, those can be opportunities as well. Uh, and finally, another flip side of one of the challenges I mentioned 
is that precisely because a lot of journalists are overstretched and under a lot of pressure to turn around content, that also provides an opportunity to give them professional, reliable, and compelling content by Palestinians or from Palestine um, that they are welcome and appreciate being able to, to, to use. So I will bring my remarks uh, to a close with that and just really underline the, the two points that I sort of um, stressed at the start. Uh, firstly, that is, despite the, you know, the difficulties and the continuation uh, in certain spaces, important spaces, of misleading and you know, also sometimes dehumanizing uh, coverage of Palestinians, the media isn't static, right? It, doesn't, it hasn't just frozen in time. Uh, and it is shifting and it is changing, both as a consequence of these wider public opinion shifts um, and in response to careful strategic work designed to, to you know, accelerate those changes. And those opportunities are there, uh, they're only increasing, um, and I think that will ultimately play um, an important role in the bigger shifts that we all hope to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben White. Now we have Khaled Lahroub and his reading to the Palestine and Western and Arab media discourse. Good afternoon to you all. There are three main titles I would like to allude to. The last, the third and last is the most important, but I'll go through the first two rather quickly. I'll delve deeply into the third one. The first is what does Israel and Zionism want to say to the world uh, through the media? Secondly, what, what, is, what are the things that Israel and Zionism want to hide from us and we have to uncover. Thirdly, what can be the recommendations and ideas uh, how we can respond to this situation? This can be put under the title of uh, to, to revive the saying that Palestine is my personal front in this battle. But uh, as regards the first two titles as to what, uh, what does Israel and what Zionism want to say to the world and to promote in the world, we know that they want to portray Israel as a country which is peaceful, which is democratic, surrounded by savage Arabs and Palestinians. and despite the fact that there is a peace process, so don't worry about the Palestinians wherever you are, that peace is coming. Yes, it's true, it's taken 30 years and it may take another 30, but nonetheless the process is there. So this is like an Air Force providing cover for the infantry, infantry soldiers on the ground to gain more ground. And on top of that, what Israel and Zionism want to promote since the beginning of this colonial struggle, that we have the grand narrative. The grand narrative is ours, and that is this epic return after 3,000 years after the diaspora, suffering, etc. Now that we are back within this long narrative, there may be some victims here and there. There can be the Palestinian people, but they are nonetheless a small detail in all of this. This, by the way, is the same narrative on which uh, the United States was built, that people who were, who were being suff under uh, uh, suffering in Europe, they went to the U.S. and they built a new world. And uh, albeit uh, that maybe 60 million people of the native population were wiped out, but that is just a side issue, a coll collateral damage type of thing. And Zionism played on this stone that we are a smaller or miniature America in the Middle East uh, uh, acting against these savages. Netanyahu said 
they said that on the record and publicly said it's not important to say the truth. What's important is what you can succeed in publishing to become the most important narrative in the world media. Even if what you're saying amounts to a huge lie, but if you manage to get it to spread around, this is the real story. And he said this in a famous statement. What does Israel want to say to the Arabs, specifically in this wave of normalization? They're saying, we have a problem, it's true, but our problem is with the Palestinians, not with you, Saudis and Emiratis. You're outside the scope of this problem. This is a very strong argument, and we have to be careful about it, especially with the new generations. They say to them the Palestinians rejected all the peace initiatives. And in an atmosphere of ignorance, these statements resonate widely, widely. Israel is not doing anything in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or the UAE, so therefore it has no problems with them. And this particular juncture, this is a main feature of the Israeli discourse. Also, Israel saying that the danger comes from Iran, and we are standing with you against Iran. So this is another important aspect in what Israel wants to say and to repeat saying to the Arabs. Normalization with us is beneficial to you, the Israelis say. So if we get your uh, your money and our brains and uh, your workforce together will be winners all. This is since the day of Ben-Gurion, this uh, triangle of an advanced uh, uh, Jewish brain which comes from Europe and the cheap manpower in the Arab world and the, Ar the abundance of Arab wealth this put together, this will, will produce miracles. Of course, the brain will have to lead the process here, and going through Shimon Perez and Netanyahu, they all more or less say the same thing, albeit in different shapes or forms. And also now they say we all belong. This is a, an addition, a new creative thing that we all go back to Abraham and the all Abrahamic religions, monotheistic religions. And this is one of the new Israeli and Zionist uh, uh, ideas. So what does Israel and Zionism want to cover? They want to cover the fact that their project is based on racism, apartheid, and they want to cover up this important origin. And Israel, on top of that, from the days of Herzl until now, that Israel's part and parcel of the Western project when they stood up to the, or uh, when Herzl met uh, the Russian Tsar or British officials, uh, they said, we are the bridge for Western civilization into the barbaric East. Uh, this is part of the Western colonial uh, project, uh, whether by definition or by design. Then they do not say they are an independent uh, project. And they also want to cover up what is known at the academic level, that uh, there is an American Western project to protect Israel, to to make it uh, the, uh, the superpower or the power above all militarily and technologically. Israel should be stronger than all the other armies in the region put together. This is said or implied in the Congress or in the United States. And the other side of this that the Zionists do not want to say publicly is that uh, the, a condition for the survival of Israel is the continuation of Arabs as fragmented and, uh, and united. If any Arab country becomes strong, even if it's a country that normalizes relations with Israel like the UAE, this will be considered as constituting a threat to Israel. This is what is... Uh, repeated uh, as part of the discourse. Uh, 
I have this stopwatch here, and it's, it's frightening me. It keeps reminding me, terrorizing me, in fact. So the third point is what we should do at the individual level and the uh, establishmental level. There are, at the Palestinian, Arab, international levels, huge blocks, silent blocks. They support us, but they do not do anything or say anything. Suddenly we should give up the culture of complaining and moaning all the time into being proactive and uh, active. We keep saying they should be doing that and they should be doing this. Who is this unknown who is supposed to do all these things that you and I should be doing and we're hanging on their shoulder all the time? I say, I call this the party of they should have done and the party of they supposed to have done. We have to know who should be doing what. If we're talking about leaders, official leaders, then we know they're not going to do anything. We have to move to what I call the front of Palestine is my responsibility as an individual. I should pose this constant question, what should or what can I do for the question of cause of Palestine? I, as Tom, Dick, or Harry, what, what can I do as an individual? It's not easy to move from this uh, culture of complaining constantly to a proactive individual activating silent voices. Uh, and I can give you some figures which come to my mind, maybe they are naive and simple, but let's be naive for a little while. Today, if we are 15 million Palestinians and hundreds of millions of people support us, if we have just one million people in the world devoting one hour to Palestine, contacting people, protesting against uh, an article, uh, giving likes to material published, one hour a month. This will mean one million working hours a month for the sake of Palestine. That means 30,000 working hours per day, 4,200 employees working full time. This is what it means. If, if we have voluntarily people devoting one hour uh, but of course, we have more than that. But what's happening in actual fact that we all belong to the front of not doing anything. All, all are members of the party of we should do this, we should be doing that. But after all, who is going to be the person who does that in actual fact? When there is a campaign to collect signatures, for example. On the WhatsApp, all what's required of me is to one click and forward to Abdullah and Kamil and my friends, my members of my group. All this, Abdullah, when he receives the forwarding from me, he forwards it. So this little thing will go around and round in the world, collecting signatures and produces, uh, so, uh, we ultimately, if we don't do that, we'll only find a thousand signatures rather than millions because everybody assumes that somebody else who is supposed to be doing this is doing that, while in fact nobody's doing it. If we take the action ourselves, then this million people will be millions within an hour or two. Of course, uh, there are TV stations, there are media outlets, they work for the, in the service of the Palestinian cause, but we have to know uh, how we can move the largest possible number from the membership of the party of waiting for others to do to us doing what we're supposed to do. Sometimes little things that appear to be insignificant can prove to be consequential. There was an Israeli app which follows all what is said about Israel in Canada, Australia, they send it to you, and you have to, if you're Israeli, you visit this, 
You just do, if there's something against Israel, you do thumb down and dislike. Suddenly, this article, which is published in Mozambique, will have 5,000 dislikes. The editor will go to the author of this article and say, what the hell are you doing here? So therefore, people who haven't even read the article, they managed to dissuade the paper or the, the site from publishing these uh, articles. So all what we have to do is to do this dislike thing. If we go to any film or documentary or clip on YouTube, when you go to likes and dislike, if you, say, if you find 10,000 dislikes, you go to another. Maybe the 10,000 dislikes are all manufacturers. Maybe there's material which is pro-Palestine. So therefore, the intended action may be very simple in this hour we devote, but added to the efforts of others, added to the efforts of the group of Palestine is our concern or our responsibility, then it will be. I have two, three minutes left. It's also it's important that we have to understand the terminology. The Palestinian also entered into circulation a number of terminology when they say talks with the Israeli side. What does the word side? They occupy our country. They're colonializing our country. There is a hierarchy. Now they're just reduced to the Israeli side, which sounds very neutral. Even at the Palestinian level, nobody hears the word Palestine as a whole, as an expression of a political and geographical entity. We hear things like the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the uh, Arabs in, inside the 1948 areas, the Arabs of the, of the Nagaf uh, desert, whatever. They're all manufactured uh, terms, but we take and implement without knowing. The last point uh, is related to normalization, this wave we are going through now. Maybe we hope that we will not see more of them in the near future. In the context of our campaign against normalization, we have to be aware of what our enemy is saying, the grand questions through which the enemy penetrates into our societies, like Facebook, like which go to Iraq, Tunisia. They talk about uh, uh, Jewish dishes, uh, types of food which is common in Israel and Morocco and Iraq. When you find this kind of soft, uh, soft approach, you will be surprised. You see people from the Emirates or Saudi Arabia, or maybe they're just uh, odd uh, uh, voices which do not represent uh, the Saudis. But oh, I, I would like to mention an important recommendation. Say, I say, kill, kill this uh, uh, copy with contact. A few Saudis or a few individuals and now they present themselves as the legitimate representative of the Saudis, and they really provoke things. Sometimes because it's pro because it's so provocative, I forward it to others. In fact, I'm serving them, I'm providing them with a service, and I should kill this kind of content there and then. Suddenly, this. Uh, content which does not represent 1% of the Saudi people has 50 million followers because we all uh, contributed to the distribution of this content. So therefore, I recommend to you all that if you get some, some content, especially if the source is uh, Arabic, do not uh, forward it. Kill it there and then. Just leave it there and then. Do not forward, forward it, because that way you will put an end to it. The other question related to normalization, people say that Palestinians themselves are normalizing the, the mistakes by the victim do not justify the crimes 
of the aggressor of uh, or the oppressor the, some mistakes by some victims do not uh, legitimize the uh, of course we know from the question of uh, human trafficking uh, and slavery in in africa there were some african tribe african tribes who aided and abetted the slave traders, but this does not justify slavery ultimately. Because now people say, ah, oh, but the Palestinians said this, the Palestinians did that. All of this should be looked at from this angle. And also, we should not generalize. We should not curse the Saudi people or the Emirati people because there are regimes and policies which can be cursed and sworn at, but uh, pragmatically, first, and ethically, and as a matter of principle, too, we should not generalize because I think, uh, I think uh, uh, we have to be authoritarian sometimes. Your time is over. So. So I, I hid my stopwatch so that it doesn't terrorize me. I think we've come to the end of the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very distinctive intervention that shined light on very important uh, points. Uh, so we would like to give the floor now to uh, Dr. Yusuf Munir from Washington. Good evening, good afternoon. Opportunity to address you and thank you uh, to the organizers for what has been a fantastic conference. Uh, I'll be making my remarks today in English. And I'll be speaking on Palestine, uh, specifically in the US media. Before I begin, let me just say that my remarks today are not the product of a systematic study of US media on Palestine but rather based on my own personal observations of nearly two decades of writing in and appearing in US mainstream media on the topic of Palestine, as well as personal engagement with journalists, editors, and producers during this time as well. Uh, in my remarks now, I will try to do three things. Provide some historic and cultural context to consider regarding US media. Discuss some important trends in recent years that shaped Palestine coverage, and last, mention a few specific anecdotes that suggest important change. When it comes to historic and cultural context to understand coverage in the US media, it's worth keeping in mind several things. First, America's position, as well as a general public ignorance of the world at large. When one compares US media even to European media, for example, an immediate difference arises when it comes to the extent and depth of coverage of news from outside the country. This is a product of American history and its geographic separation from the world. Because of this, foreign affairs usually receives less attention than they do elsewhere unless it is covered through the prism of American military engagement abroad, which is itself an unfriendly lens toward Palestine and the people of the region. Second, a crucial context is, of course, a stereotyped view of the Middle East, its peoples and its culture, which routinely finds its way into coverage. Third, the issues of racism more broadly and Islamophobia in particular. We see these dynamics present often through common examples. One such example is what I would call death by passive voice. While headlines tell us, for example, that Israelis are killed by Palestinians, Palestinians simply die. How? By who? One particularly notorious example of this uh, was during the uh, Israeli war on Gaza in 2014. Many of you uh, will remember the attack on uh, Palestinians who gathered to watch the World Cup on a beach in Gaza. Uh, the Israeli airstrike uh, killed about eight or nine Palestinians on that day. The headline in the New York Times read, Missile at Beachside Gaza Cafe finds patrons poised for World Cup. No mention 
of the results of the attack, where the missile came from, or even the fact that Palestinians were killed. This is just one example of the type of racism and discrimination that Palestinians in particular face when it comes to coverage. Another example is the equation of our bodies with bullets or other weapons of war. When Palestinian protesters are brutally repressed with violent and lethal means by Israel, this is called a clash, as if there was some parity between those things that were colliding. Thirdly, the demonization of our struggle, our protests and demonstrations are routinely called riots, our grievances are routinely portrayed as illegitimate or deceptive. Importantly, this racist treatment in the media, and I believe Ben alluded, this, uh, alluded to this as well, cannot be seen separately from the treatment of many peoples who have struggled against racist domination or colonialism against the West, and in fact, we see similar examples in US coverage of these struggles as well. A third crucial context is the dominance of the Zionist narrative in the United States and the significant influence of Christian evangelicals as an organized community in the country. It's important to acknowledge that the media is just one part of an information sphere that is also shaped by other parts, including pastors and preachers from whom Palestine is seen through the prism of biblical history or prophecy. The US also has the world's largest Jewish population, which became increasingly Zionist after 1967 and is highly and effectively organized in its advocacy. What all of this context amounts to, in short, is an uphill battle for Palestinian voices in the US media. But in recent years, there have been several key trends which have begun to change this. First, the shift in public opinion on the issue in the last 20 years and the growing partisan nature of public opinion on Palestine in the United States is an important trend. This was discussed uh, in Saturday's workshop on public opinion in greater depth by Professor Shibli Talhami. Along with a growing partisan divide, which is partly a reflection of political events, there's also a partially overlapping demographic divide. We might call this the David and Goliath perception shift. The older generation of Americans grew up in an information environment that was telling them that Israel is the underdog, surrounded by belligerent Arab states, yet miraculously triumphing either because of its unique ingenuity or divine intervention. But the reality for a younger generation of Americans, especially those who are increasingly turning to social media and alternative sources of information, is very different. The dominant image of Israel this generation has grown up with is not the Israel of 1948 in the wake of the Holocaust, nor is it the Israel of the 1967 war, but rather it is the Israel that repeatedly pounds civilian infrastructure in Lebanon and Gaza with its high-powered air force, navy, drones, and tanks. While we Palestinians know that Israel was never a David to our Goliath, younger demographics in America are increasingly piercing through this perception today as well. Concurrently, social justice upheaval in the United States has forced new conversations about race and critical history that's begun to change the ways mainstream media talks about issues of race and power. This critical lens on history and power is a far friendlier one to Palestinians than those that preceded it. This upheaval has also led to changes in the way newsrooms actually look with greater diversity in the spaces that make and shape coverage and conversations about these issues. It's a lot harder to demand racist coverage in a room with people who are going to be critical about that coverage. Who is in the room matters greatly, and I've witnessed firsthand how this has led to far more empathetic coverage of Palestinians and led to greater inclusion of Palestinian voices. Additionally, today there is greater organized capacity in the United States of professional firms and organizations working to engage with the media on Palestine coverage, and this has undoubtedly contributed positively. Now I want to raise some specific anecdotes which to me represent this change that's taking place. Here I want to introduce the concept of crisis moments. I think Ben alluded to this idea a little bit. Crisis moments in this context are moments which produce long-term sustained coverage of Palestine. 
for all the contextual reasons that I mentioned at the start, these moments are rare. But because they are rare and sustained over time, when they occur, they represent significant opportunities to both impact and assess the changing discourse on Palestine. In recent years, we can look at the Israeli war on Gaza in 2014, the Great Return March in 2018, and the Unity Intifada of May and June of 2021. I go into greater detail about US media coverage during the war on Gaza in 2014 in an article for the Journal of Palestine Studies under the title of Crisis Moments for those who are interested. There, I looked closely at cable news and print coverage over the 55-day period, and while the images of Israeli bombardment shocked many, long-standing biases led to a narration of events which ultimately blamed Palestinians for their own suffering. Time and again, we would hear about human shields dominating the conversation. On social media, of course, the discussion was different, but traditional media lagged far behind, rarely humanizing Palestinians, which much more often than not were either demonized or reduced to mere statistics. By 2018, the Great Return March, we began to see some changes. Once again, the images were shocking, but the narrative this time, slightly different. It was also much harder to spin Israeli snipers shooting journalists, nurses, and protesters from hundreds of meters away behind a fence as self-defense, even though many still tried. In 2021, though, during the Unity Intifada, which began, of course, in Sheikh Jarrah, but shook the whole of Palestine, we saw the most significant changes yet. The New York Times, a standard bearer in US media, which has long been a bastion of pro-Israel coverage, ran no less than six opinion pieces by Palestinians in May and June of that year. This was previously unthinkable. Further, in May, it also carried on its front page the names and faces of approximately 60 children killed during that time. All but two were Palestinian. This too was previously unthinkable and it led to outrage among many establishment pro-Israel organizations who accused the New York Times of blood libel for merely humanizing Palestinians. There are also new voices in US media today which bring far more critical approaches on Palestine than many of their counterparts, including Mehdi Hassan, for example, and Ayman Mahyuddin. Many of you may remember Ayman's coverage of the war on Gaza in 2014 for NBC News, he was playing soccer on the beach in Gaza with the four Becker boys who were killed just a little while later in an Israeli strike. Ayman's coverage of those events was a rarity in US media as he was covering Palestinian tragedy with depth, compassion, and context. You may also remember that within a day or so of that coverage, Ayman was removed from the story and replaced by NBC's Richard Engel. Today, however, Muhyiddin has his own show on MSNBC, named Ayman, and the Palestinian-American host regularly covers Palestine and features Palestinian voices when many others do not. And here's another juxtaposition that tells the tale of a shift in the United States. In 2012, during yet another Israeli bombardment of Gaza, airstrikes on cars marked TV killed three Palestinian journalists. In 2014, the museum, a museum in Washington, D.C. focused on the history of journalism, removed the names of those Palestinian journalists from a list honoring journalists killed in conflict after it came under pressure from Zionist organizations to do so. Last year, however, after she was brutally murdered by an Israeli sniper, Shirin Abu Akhle was posthumously awarded the National Press Club's President's Award only given in rare instances for contributions to journalism. In a decade, the American journalism establishment went from running away from Palestinians to honoring those killed for telling the world what Israel is doing to them. Whatever the change is taking place, we know that they have come at too high a price and they are still coming too slowly. For those of us working in the American media environment, we know it is incumbent upon us to continue to push these changes forward. However, from where I sit, the task does appear slightly less daunting today than any time in the last two decades, 
and this should not go unnoticed. Thank you. شكرا جزيلا دكتور يوسف منير فقط اذكركم بكتابه اسمائكم على الاوراق المتاحه امامكم لتسليمها للمنسقين اذا اردتم طرح اسئله على المتحدثين بعد انتهاء مداخلتهم ننتقل الى ضيفتنا من نيويورك دكتور كيتي هالبر الكلمه لك لنستمع الى قصه مختلفه نوعا ما من تعامل الاعلام الامريكي والسلطات الأمريكية حتى مع طرحها تفضلي Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference um, I actually may need some tech help because I was going to read something that was on the screen but I don't see it which is a great opportunity to stretch Hey, thank you I'm also not a doctor, just fair warning, but thank you for the upgrade. <laughs> see, we already see more silencing of critical voices on, the, on Israel. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the media and the U.S. media and its coverage of Palestine, but also I'm going to talk a little bit about something that happened to myself, something that happened to me. Uh, not because I'm a narcissist, but because it offers, I think, an interesting, important case study into how uh, censorship works in the U.S. media, especially on the issue of Palestine. So, um, and in terms of why this is an important issue, if the United States is Israel's greatest ally and supporter, the U.S. media is Israel's greatest whitewasher and sanitizer and enabler. And as someone who works in the U.S. media and has worked in both corporate and independent media, I'm going to start with uh, this story because it pulls back, I think, the curtain on how media censorship works. Uh, and it also is an example of larger trends. So I also want to be clear, though, that what happened to me pales in comparison to what happens on a daily basis to Palestinians and Arabs and Palestinian Americans and Arab Americans who face censorship and far worse on a daily basis. So. Um, in my writing and podcasts and videos, I try to straddle comedy and the news. I use humor or try to use humor to make what is often depressing and serious news less painful to digest because I want people to laugh instead of cry or at least not turn away. I should warn you that this presentation is not going to be funny, by the way. Um, it's not a knee slapper, so apologies in advance. But uh, as you've heard, I'm the host of two independent podcasts and YouTube shows. And... Um, I also am, have participated in corporate media, and I was, uh, for three years, I was a regular weekly guest on this show called Rising, which is this very polished corporate media show put out by the newspaper The Hill. And uh, in addition to being a weekly guest, I had started working as a host. I had also shot a pilot for a show that I'd pitched them, which was an all-women's panel show, a kind of younger version of The View, a left version of The View, which I still want to do. Um, and I'm very critical of corporate media, and I write a lot of media criticism, but I also thought it was a useful way to kind of infiltrate corporate media. And um, what was interesting about this show, Rising on the Hill, is that it was very polished, and it looks like cable news, a basic cable news channel, but you're allowed to say things in theory that, you're, that you usually only hear in independent media. So, and I think that's very useful. Um, this is a whole other discussion, but I think independent media, we, have to, we really struggle with this, how to look like media that isn't just independent, that has a, a, a vibe or a look that isn't just grassroots and non-profity because for better or for worse, I think if we want to reach people who don't already agree with us, it helps to have a certain look. Um, so, uh, and The Hill also has a huge audience. So I, I felt like I was using uh, this corporate media platform in a kind of subversive way to talk about things like Palestine and ironically enough to talk about things like uh, corporate media censorship. And as a host, you get to write and record um, these op-ed monologues about whatever you want. There's no editorial process. You email the producers and they upload the monologue into the teleprompter. So in September, I wrote and recorded one about Israel being an apartheid state, 
uh, but it never aired. And uh, here's the opening, though, of the video, it's, uh, which I would wind up recording with an independent news outlet, uh, which I'll get into later. But the video is uh, 12 minutes long, so we're not going to watch the whole thing, but we're just going to watch um, a, a few minutes of it. So could we play this video? Thank you. The following monologue is something that I wrote, delivered, and recorded at the Hill. It was then censored, and I was then canceled and fired. Representative Rashida Tlaib has been condemned by some over comments she made about Israel. Here's CNN's Jake Tapper reporting on what the Michigan Democrat said and the response it prompted. Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan facing criticism today from what several of her Jewish colleagues have deemed anti-Semitic comments. Here's what Tlaib, the first Palestinian-American woman to serve in Congress, said at a virtual event yesterday. I want you all to know that among progressives, it has become clear that you cannot claim to hold progressive values, yet back Israel's apartheid government, and we will continue to push back and not accept this idea that you are progressive, progressive except for Philistine any longer. The CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, slammed the comments saying that Israel does not have an apartheid government and said that she should not be imposing a, quote, litmus test in a tweet saying, quote, Tlaib tells American Jews that they need to pass an anti-Zionist litmus test to participate in progressive space. Some of Tlaib's Jewish colleagues in Congress agreed. Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz called her comments, quote, outrageous and, quote, nothing short of anti-Semitic. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is right. It is outrageous. It's outrageous that Rashida Tlaib is getting attacked. Tlaib is merely stating that Israel is an apartheid state and that people who claim to have progressive values cannot support an apartheid state. No matter how loose a definition of progressive we use, it certainly excludes supporting a racist apartheid system. What's outrageous is attacking Tlaib for pointing out that progressive except for Palestine is an intrinsically contradictory position. What's also outrageous is that the Anti-Defamation League's Jonathan Greenblatt would claim that Israel is not an apartheid government. What's outrageous is that Jake Tapper would accept Greenblatt's judgment as the truth and not propaganda that needed to be pushed back against. I understand that Greenblatt and perhaps Tapper feel like Israel is not an apartheid state, but unfortunately for them, apartheid isn't about your feelings. It's about facts. In 1973, the UN defined the crime of apartheid as any inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. In 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court defined apartheid as inhumane acts of a character that are committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. These inhuman acts include... So, uh, oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so that's just the beginning of the video, and what I do through the video is I make the argument that, of course, Palestinians have been making for decades, which is that Israel is an apartheid state. And to do that, I cite um, international law, Palestinian human rights groups, Israeli human rights groups, inter uh, international human rights groups, Israeli politicians, interestingly enough, and Israeli prime ministers, also interestingly enough, uh, which is very funny when people accuse you of being an anti-Semite for saying that Israel is an apartheid state because apparently certain prime ministers of Israel are either anti-Semites or self-loathing Jews. Um, and uh, I also cite uh, South Africans who obviously not only lived through apartheid but dismantled it. So I, the video cites Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, and uh, South Africa's Minister for International Relations, Naledi Pandor, who made the case as recently as this fall at the UN uh, uh, General Assembly. So I also, I also pointed out, I'm going to quote something else I said in the video, which is, I was born in New York City. My great-grandparents were from Eastern Europe. I could move to Israel today, buy a house, get a job, travel around with no problem. So could Jake Tapper and Jonathan Greenblatt. But a Palestinian like Rashida Tlaib can't even visit her family home in what is now Israel. End quote. So after I delivered that monologue and I recorded it, I hosted several other segments with guests, had a great time, and left for the day. And as I was leaving, I got a call from a producer, and I could tell something was wrong from her voice, and she wanted me to hear it from her that my monologue would not be posted uh, by The Hill. It wasn't going to be released. 
the higher-ups had seen it, and they decided that uh, they weren't going to run it. And, th and this producer told me that she didn't know, but there was a policy at the Hill that they wouldn't run op-eds about Israel. So over the next few days, I urged the producers to convince the higher-ups to publish the video anyway. And some, after some back and forth, I got a call from the executive editor of The Hill, uh, and sorry, the editor-in-chief. And he told me that they were not releasing the video. He told me they were killing it. I reached out to the producers again and asked them if I could at least bring up the topic in a segment. So not to get too into the weeds, but I appear on the show as both a guest and as a host. And uh, as a guest, you kind of can chat about things more informally. As a host, you get to do these written straight to camera monologues. So I was willing to just do it as a, as a guest. And then I was told to check my email, and a higher up told me I was no longer needed at Rising, and very generously encouraged me to feel free to submit any unpaid invoices, and very graciously wished me the best of luck. And that was it. So after three years of being on the show, it was done. And I'm very, very lucky, relatively speaking. I mean, just very lucky because it's not my only job. So I didn't sacrifice a lot. Um, I got a lot of support and solidarity. And I was able to make the video with an independent outlet called Breakthrough News. So that's the, the version you saw is the video that I made with Breakthrough News. And of course, uh, how much, how long have I gone? I know, time flies when you're having fun. Five minutes, like Okay, sure, okay. So I joined the ranks of, you know, great people like Mark Lamont Hill, who was fired by CNN as a contributor after he called for a free Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, Nathan Robinson, who was fired by The Guardian for making a joke about uh, the United States' obscene support for Israel, military aid for Israel. Abby Martin, who was barred from speaking at the University of Georgia for refusing to sign a contract condemning BDS. Uh, journalist Emily Wilder, who was fired by the AP uh, for pro-Palestine tweets. And the late, great trailblazing uh, and glass ceiling, ceiling shattering uh, reporter Helen Thomas, who basically had her career ended when she dared to express the slightest support of Palestinians and dared to criticize Israel. Uh, she was basically forced into retirement. But again, uh, being, interestingly enough, being pro-Palestinian is considered biased, but being pro-Israel is just considered neutral. Uh, it's considered employable. So you have someone like CNN's Wolf Blitzer, who was a professional Israel lobbyist and is a fixture at CNN. You also have working U.S. journalists whose children serve in the IDF, and you cannot imagine a journalist, a U.S. journalist, having even a distant relative who is part of any Palestinian organization. Um, and obviously, there's major censorship of people outside of the media. I won't get into that now, but you all know the, the famous cases. Um, although I will point out, one person who survived uh, firing attempts, uh, Joseph Massad, the professor at Columbia, I just have to point out that Barry Weiss, the journalist who fancies herself a free speech zealot, uh, cut her teeth trying to get Joseph Massad fired as a professor at Columbia. Uh, so, so much for her being against cancel culture. Uh, so, uh, again, as I, I just want to re restate that Palestinians are censored or smeared all the time or worse, and as you all know, Several journalists have been killed by Israeli forces. Um, fair, fairness and accuracy in, re accuracy in reporting uh, reports that over 50 journalists have been killed by Israeli forces since 2001. Sharon Abu Akleh, the most well-known among them. And of course, I think part of the reason she got the amount of press she did, and she deserved that and much more, is because she was an American Palestinian. If she, had she just been Palestinian, we probably wouldn't even have heard of her. Um, so, uh, I, I wanted to just share this story because, again, not only because it's therapeutic, uh, just kidding, but uh, because I do think it's uh, an important, it sheds important light onto how these things happen. And these things usually happen behind the scenes. So I was lucky in a way that my producer just said to me, point blank, uh, we're, we don't do op-eds on Israel. Usually it's kind of, uh, it's not stated overtly. And um, I don't think the higher-ups wanted her to tell me. I think that she that was supposed to be private information. And actually, when the executive, ed when the editor-in-chief called me and I asked, to tell me they wouldn't be running the monologue, the video, I asked him why not, and he offered these really un unconvincing 
obviously dishonest excuses. First, he said, like, they passed on stories all the time, which is true, perhaps, but with these monologues, there's n literally no editorial process. You would just email the producer, they would put them into the teleprompter and then publish them. He also said that, like, it didn't fit into the, uh, their sweet spot of coverage, which was domestic news, which was laughable because I'd done literally hundreds of shows with them talking about foreign policy and, of course, the story about Rashida Tlaib falls under the rubric of domestic news. Um, they also, behind the scenes, told my colleagues that I wasn't fired over ideological reasons but over stylistic ones, which they never shared what their stylistic ones were. Maybe my hair was bad or something. Um, and then there is, of course, the role of the Israel lobby, which we see all the time. Um, and as a get, again, as a guest, I had done several segments on Israel. And after one of them, this kind of ironically named organization called Honest Reporting uh, did a hit piece on me. It was called What the Hill? Get it? Because it's the Hill TV. This is just to get a sense of the kind of genius we're dealing with. Um, then there's the conflict of interest. So what's interesting is that, again, I had done lots of segments critical of Israel at the Hill, um, but what was new, and maybe this is why it became like verboten to do, was because this media conglomerate, Nexstar, bought the Hill for $130 million, and in the fall, Sagot Value Holdings Limited, an investment firm based in Tel Aviv, bought 6,100 shares uh, in Nexstar. Uh, for more than a million dollars, and Nextstar hired Jake Novak to be deputy managing uh, editor of News Nation, its cable channel. Jake Novak's previous job was working as the media director of the Israeli Consulate General in New York. He's written articles praising Trump for dropping the U.S. support for the two-state solution. Um, and by the way, his criticism of the two-state solution is obviously not the criticism we would hear in this room. Um, different ideological orientation. Um, he's defending the building of more settlements, and he led a presentation at Bar Ilan University titled Defending Israel Against Media Bias, How to Fight a News Media and Social Media Bias Against Israel, The Best Defense is a Good Offense. So all of this, and I'll, I'll wrap, but th these are just examples of, of censorship, but usually censorship, honestly, is soft censorship or self-censorship. You just get the sense that you're going to have a headache if you go after the story or if you pr uh, present something on this issue. So journalists just shy away from it because they don't want to be labeled uh, anti-Semitic. And I just do want to point out that um, something that's really important, I think, is that this claim that you're um, an anti-Semite if you're anti-Zionist is ironically actually an anti-Semitic claim because it like flattens all Jews into this monolith. Uh, who all have the same view of Israel, and the suggestion that if you're Jewish, you support Israel is based on this old anti-Semitic trope of the dual loyalty. Um, and that's something that we should keep in mind, especially with the um, IHRA, which constantly conflates Zionism, uh, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. There are two groups of people who use the word Jewish and Zionist interchangeably, and those, th those are anti-Semites and Zionists. Um, so, I was going to give some examples of how the media distorts um, the reality on the ground and how they're biased against Palestine, but you guys yeah, have I'm done that. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I really feel bad to do that, but I, I think we have only five minutes as a maximum bonus to go to the conclusion. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, I was, was going to say I'm not going to do that. Yeah, to wrap I'm up not going to do that. Okay. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, and I'll just say that one thing, like Ben pointed out, that in some ways the both sidesing of journalism is something that exists beyond Palestine. I do think that with the war in Ukraine, we have this kind of interesting controlled experiment where we could see what the media would look like if it covered Palestine the way it covers Ukraine and if it thought of Palestinians as human beings. Um, I have slides, I don't have time to get into it, but we see a lot of presentation of Ukrainians as freedom fighters versus. Palestinians as militants. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to say, oh, no, we don't, I don't, the last thing I'll say is, um, if biased media hides Israel's crimes as well as Palestinians' humanity, media censorship shows that the blockade doesn't end in Gaza. The U.S. is not just a complicated media market. It is Israel's largest military sponsor and consistent provider of political cover. There is a reason that the stakes are so high on the covering of Palestine. 
because there's a growing number of Americans uncomfortable with what their tax dollars are paying for and what their politicians are saying in their name, developing a media that can name names, put faces to those names, and tells the stories from what is happening to regular Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank to how we got here, who is complicit, what needs to happen, to ask the hard questions about the sanctity of Palestinian life and to protect it. We can and we must create the independent media that does that. Thank you. Thank you, Lucky Katie. Well, thank you and thank you all our panelists. We open the floor now for your questions and answers. I did not receive any names from the organizers, but we can choose. We start from the ladies there. You can come to the front. Please introduce yourself first. If you need simultaneous interpretation, we have headsets for that. Please introduce yourself. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Farah Al Hashim. I am a PhD candidate, John Mullah, a director and a journalist with Associated Press. Uh, if there is, uh, if there is uh, any uh, talk about the point, uh, the honest reporting company that the Israelis created, they talk about the whole thing as one theory. Other سؤال موجه لك هل تعتقدين media is afraid. And because this is what I feel, but I would like a reconfirmation of these thoughts because I've been wondering about it. I used to say that the honest reporting is there. This is a kind of fear. The Israeli media is fearful because of the changes in the world and the support and, uh, and the celebrities like Bella Hadid and others. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should take more than one question. Beautiful handwriting. I can hardly read any. We just want to be correct and give gender equality its uh, consideration. Muhammad Amin. Thank you, Muhammad Amin, a journalist and a writer. Thank you very much for this important forum, uh, especially for those who work in the media. We really need to listen to the experts to see what, how best we can respond to the Zionist discourse. Two questions to Dr. Lahroub. The role of the individual for to uh, the Palestinians in responding to the Israeli narrative, the counter uh, attack, how should it be? The Zionist discourse is a state financed, state run, state organized. How, to what extent can any individual effort stand up to such challenges to organized work? So, please be brief, please. My second question is, there is an intersection between the discourse in the West and normalization, whether in the East or in the West. Zionism and normalization seems to be working for the sake of each other. How can we break this cycle and uh, respond to it uh, without promoting it necessarily? Farah al Hashim, she you took that Sahar al Hanedi. 
Sahar, we, we want a brief, pointed, direct question, please, for the sake of time. So, Ali to Ben White. Very much today, under the yoke of uh, the Zionists, Labour Party and the Conservative Party, uh, like you can't be a cabinet member unless you're a conservative friend of Israel. Uh, do you see any way out of uh, this situation? So, uh, Aliman. Okay. Did you write the question? It's okay. Mohammed uh, Mansour. Mohammed Mansour. I asked my question. When did you ask your question? There is a nearer microphone to you there. Mohammed Mansour, Palestinian journalist. My question to Dr. Youssef. There, there is a current change or shift in the, in the American media discourse, and the younger generation are reacting to that. Is there any real hope that the younger generation and the future decision makers in the Congress or the White House, is there a real hope that American policy towards Israel will change or will it remain constant as it is in the next 20, 30 years, absolute support of Israel? Can any change or shift in the media create any difference? Malia Buatta. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm going to quickly ask my question. I think this relates to Khaled's presentation a little bit, uh, but also everything, I guess, uh, what you've all witnessed in your careers. Um, I think that what exists, there exists a lot of soldiers that are not saying, that are not delaying the work, that are doing it, and they're doing it around the clock for little to absolutely no pay. The question is, how do we collectivize those individual soldiers? And I think people on the stage are themselves those individual soldiers that are killing themselves around the clock doing some of this work. And I think that Ben Center in particular offers an opportunity and a model that could perhaps be replicated around the world because we all cover very different areas from Europe to the US to the Arab world. Um, that, and, and so I guess I'm asking Ben but everybody else, what is the potential for that? What is there, is there a potential for establishing a network in which we can provide journalists and all those in the media with the effective training because I speak to young journalists and you're right they're misinformed on this particular political questions but they're finding themselves in the center of you know considerable mainstream outlets in which they're unable to tell the difference between which word is incredibly charged and problematic uh, towards the truth of what is what of Israel's actions um, and those that would perhaps you know, be the more kind of uh, objective language. And so I guess how do we, institu not institutionalize, but collectivize, formalize, and provide a more long-term mm -hmm. plan around forming journalists, imposing um, uh, the need for the media to be more transparent, democratizing it even, if I dare say that word, um, and uh, finally speaking the truth on what is happening uh, to Palestine and the Palestinians. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. What about us responding to these questions to see if we have any time left to take a second round? Katie, tafadali. Katie, yes, please go ahead. Um, yes, so the question about honest reporting uh, is I, I think you're right on, you're spot on that the existence of places like honest reporting signifies the progress of the other side, of our side. It shows that they're afraid that we are forced to be contended with. But unfortunately, now we have to ramp it up again because it may be that it's a sign of fear on their side, but they're winning in some ways because they've gotten people fired, uh, several people fired. So I think that um, they have money and they have institutional support and they're very institutionalized. We have numbers, so we do have to figure out uh, how to be 
organized, and I think we need to use social media and um, make it so that there is some kind of penalty that people pay uh, for basically like uh, smearing, firing, or just perpetuating racist Zionist narratives. And one thing, oh, it just went out of my head. It'll come back to me, <laughs> sorry. Too many good ideas around this room are, yeah. Okay, we'll get back to you. Dr. Khalid. Dr. Khalid. Two questions, I think they are linked. Muhammad's question and, and your compatriot, I forgot your name. I think they are one and the same. So far as the discourse of normalization, maybe there is a bit of uh, uh, generalization if we say there is intersection with the Zionists because Jordan and Egypt have normalized more than 30 years ago, but we did not see this kind of collusion or whatever we call it. There are different ways at the level of the elite, the popular level, which amounted to rejecting normalization. I think, I think this applies to one case which I admit I failed to analyze why this uh, unbelievable uh, rush into loving the other side, all this talk about Abraham, Abrahamic religion. I read Israeli articles, and th even these articles express dismay and surprise at how can this, why this rush? They, some of them think that uh, this is a deliberate attempt to penetrate into like a Trojan horse into Israel because even the enemy is surprised. What you wanted when you wanted normalization to, as, as a result of normalization to have the Jewish lobby siding with you in Washington, you've got that. This kind of uh, unprecedented uh, push and throwing themselves into the arms of the enemy, I personally cannot uh, understand. There are elements I alluded to in my introduction or in my intervention, and that is what does Israel want to say about itself and the real substances. What we should need to focus on is the essence of the matter. And there are evidence from the Israeli discourse itself that what I mentioned, for example, the survival of Israel is built on the fragmentation of Arabs. This is not an analytical point of view from my side. This is written Israeli strategies from Ben-Gurion onwards. This is Israel's condition for survival. Israel's condition for survival is for us to remain disunited and fragmented. And, uh, we want, uh, they want to say that uh, normalization will serve these countries. Israel is at your service. We say, fine, the two examples we have is Egypt and Jordan. Egypt has normalized more than 40 years ago, Jordan more than 30 years ago. The situation deteriorated from the beginning of the normalization until now. They, so therefore, we should uh, analyze what they're saying. And uh, the question of uh, your compatriot, the lady, I forgot her name. The question is difficult, but uh, we should we should share this uh, uh, responsibility. Muhammad also mentioned this in his question. The individual uh, responsibility, of course, will not stand up to the effort exerted by states. But we say, in the absence of uh, our own country states uh, not doing anything, we should not wait. We should uh, get up and get on with it and do something as individuals. At least this will fill some gaps uh, in the media and compensate uh, for the negligence uh, and shortcomings. And we move from complaining to proactive. Ben? You want to respond, please? Um, so for the 
you have a question about uh, British politics. Uh, yeah, for, for Palestinians or friends of Palestine, Westminster is a bit of a sort of depressing place um, for, for a while, but including, you know, up to today. Uh, and how it will improve is uh, a big topic, but to be honest, the key part of the answer, which isn't very exciting, is just by slow, hard work of a lot of different people. And there are organizations that work on, you know, trying to make sure that MPs are pressured and informed and that work is done in a parliamentary space to, to improve things. Part of the problem is that uh, the major parties or the two biggest parties position on Palestine is sometimes publicly is sometimes unrelated or tangentially related to Palestine itself. It can be a casualty or related to positioning on other questions or other strategies that they have for how they're positioning themselves. So, um, yeah, it's not it's not easy, um, and there's there's criticism of Israel, but it's um, you know it's reasonably limited, uh, and Palestinians especially can find, you know, or Palestinian, direct Palestinian perspectives are, are often uh, are often missing. Um, but, you know, big, big picture, pol those politicians in Westminster and, you know, cabinet level ministers, they're going to be ultimately, you know, changing their position on something like Palestine as a result of a lot of different factors, some of which are completely external to Britain, but including because of pressure from, you know, below from grassroots. Um, and just super quickly on the issue of, um, very quickly, it's a great idea to expand this type of strategic communications work in, in other countries and contexts because it has to be quite context specific. Um, but there's no reason why it can't be done, collaborating with other people doing it and amplifying people who are already working on it in the ecosystem, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Yusuf, we have to squeeze the last answer in just two minutes. Please, thank you. Yeah. I think it should be, yeah. So, um, I'll uh, be very brief in responding to... Uh, can you hear him? I, I think there is a problem Sorry. with the microphone. Okay. You can. <laughs> Another one minute. <laughs> so, um, I'll be very brief in my response and try to, to tie it into a number of different questions that were, uh, were asked here. Um, I think most helpful in, in trying to think through all of this is the idea of hegemony and the concept of hegemony. And Gramsci tells us that the power of it is its ability to control the limits of ideas and discourse without having to wield the force of intimidation or coercion, right? And I think for a long time there was a hegemony for the pro-Israel narrative uh, in Western media and in the United States in, in particular. That hegemony has cracked. It has cracked wide open, in some spaces more than others. But that's the precise reason why we are seeing all of the type of coercive measures that we are seeing today in response. People being removed from their jobs, to professors being fired, political uh, donations suddenly going to primary candidates at moments when they had never needed to do that before. All of this is a response, uh, Farah, and this gets to, to, to your question. And I think also to your question about what is, is, is there hope? Is there possibility? I think this suggests that that's absolutely the case. And, you know, the, the position of the Israeli government in recent years has been something that you actually said, Katie, in your, in, in your comments referring to the, the fellow that um, was uh, Novak, I think you said, yeah. responsible uh -huh. for um, uh, at the Hill for editorial content. Um, that their position is to go from defense to offense, to go on the attack, okay? Um, if you have hegemonic control, there's no need even for defense. But they're at the stage now where they have to go on offense to hold ground that has been lost. And so I think to, to answer your question, absolutely. When, 20, 30 years down the line, nobody, nobody can tell. But I don't think we have the luxury of not believing that there is hope. Thank you very much. Shukran jazilan lakum duyufana. Our guests, our panelists, first of all, Dr. Yusuf, Ben, Dr. Khalid, and Katie. Time is over. I'm sorry. 
but the organizers are telling me the time is over for this session. Thank you very much. We meet in other sessions.